Uh, good morning. The purpose for today is the discussion around the DC appliance systems that SSS has to offer to the market. So what we're going to try and achieve is to understand each component of these systems, how the systems function, what the risk is within the systems, um, how they've been manufactured, and the thought process behind the manufacturing of these individual systems. So let's just quickly talk about the DC concept. The principle behind the DC concept is to make sure that the customer has a required load that he can use and that load can be managed via the DC system. If we have an AC system, the customer has ability to put anything onto the system and the calculation and control of that system becomes a lot more difficult. So the principle behind it is by supplying a DC system, we in theory control the customer um, load analysis much better than what we would be able to do in the AC system, giving a longer sustainable method <coughs> um, of energy to the house, to the domestic user. The, 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 the panel's producing DC, the battery's holding DC, so obviously the system is a lot more efficient in its functionality than that of an AC system. <coughs> so um, when speaking to people, you find that they are concerned that the customer doesn't have enough choice within the principle of a DC system. Well, over, over time, that has changed. So the customer has now a selection of whatever lights he wants because of the, the, the LED space. Um, he has a choice of um, cell phone charging or laptop charging or um, uh, selection of different televisions a selection of DSTV, um, HD satellite uh, TV. He can get any fan that he wants in DC. He can get uh, even an iron, um, hair dryers. So to find out what is available, you're welcome to just um, ask for the full appliance list on DC. But what's important is, as I, as I started with, is the configuration of a system what the customer will use, how we will use that system, because at the end of the day, each DC system has a maximum input, a maximum storage, and a maximum output. So if we can understand the input, the, the, the storage, and the output, and configure that to the actual appliances that he has in the DC system, that creates a successful DC system. So the discussion about how does he use his appliances, now here you've got to have a little bit of an ex a little bit of experience in where the system is going to be applied. So we would normally refer to this as diversity of use. In other words, if he has three lights on a DC system, how long will he be using those three lights, and how much energy will those three lights consume per hour? In other words, we need to understand the watt hours of consumption for every appliance. So as a rule of thumb, we would take the amount of lights times the wattage of that light times what we would predict he would use, which would be an acceptable, which would be an acceptable period. So lights, let's say eight hours. Let's talk about the television. The television can be used normally in normal households. The diversity of a television is six to eight hours. But also, if somebody is at home alone, the television could be used for the period of, of 14 hours. So the calculation and formulation that you make effectively determines the success or failure of that DC system. Again, I mentioned that we have um, a limited input, a limited storage, and a limited load output. So to be able to understand the DC system, you've got to understand what appliances that he would be using on that system, the appliances that you would be offering, for what period of time would he be using in that system, um, and what would your overall diversity of that system be. What SSS has done is SSS has configured certain pre-configured systems, and that's referred to in our color range um, brochure, which is also available for you to, 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 to um, get if you, need to, if you feel that you want to use our configuration. Um, <clears throat> we've used colors to, to, to easily describe the system. So you'll see the red system basically has, has lights, 
And then moving from the red system, you would go to the orange system, which would add just a TV. Um, then you would go to add um, uh, a possible bigger TV. And then you could add a fridge or a freezer. And so the different configurations in our color range, we have done the diversity calculation, which would be acceptable to consumer. And because we've been doing it for so many years, we've now worked out what that diversity calculations actually are. And we feel comfortable that if you apply the appliances per our color range, that you will be safe in the sustainable um, delivery of an energy system to those appliances required by the, by the, by the customer. So to be able to do this, and previously, we always used lead-acid batteries. The whole market has now changed, and this is why we're making this, because the new DC systems are incorporating in the use of lithium fast batteries. So by going, to a, by going to the calculation process of a DC system, the first thing that we've got to understand is what size panel do we put on it. Now, a panel produces power when it's in a perfect condition at a specific rate. But many times, that panel, and, and just to define that, if you've got a panel facing due north, and the panel is 100 watt, you now can calculate how many predicted watt hours you are going to generate in that panel. In other words, um, if, you've got, if you're up in the north where the sun is good and you should go and find out what your radiation factor is, um, and once you've found out what your radiation factor is, you can then calculate what the kilowatt hours that will potentially be generated with the panel facing north at a specific angle will be able to give you in an average per day. If you need help with those calculations, we would gladly do it for you. And what we would then deliver to you is, if I had 1,000 watt peak of panels, um, you would be able to generate 4.5 kilowatt hours or 4.7 kilowatt hours or 5.5 kilowatt hours. And if you're really in a good sun area, maybe you could even get to 6 kilowatt hours for every 1,000 watt peak of panels. Once you've got that factor of 4.5 or 6, then it becomes easy because you divide the panel size and you times that by the factor that will give you the average watt hours that is generated for that panel as an average throughout, throughout the year. But you must also know that you've also got to take into consideration that some days there are bad weather. Now what you've got to do is you've got to say what is the potential generation in bad weather days? And what we've done is we've defined that process in semi-bad weather days, full bad weather days, and really bad weather days. So we know that if a panel um, of 1,000 watts is going to generate a factor of 4.5, it's going to generate 4.5 kilowatt hours per day as an average. But when you have overcast weather, it might only generate 3.5. And if you have rain, rain weather, it might only generate 1.5. So this in a DC system is referred to as what the autonomy of storage should be to accommodate bad weather days. We're not going to go into the technical detail of that because our focus here is more on the, on the, on the appliances, the distribution box, and the configuration. But within a DC system, you have to understand what your generation capacity and risks within that generation capacity will be. You have to understand what the diversity of a customer will be with the appliances that he would like to use. Um, you, you've also got to understand what storage capacity that you have and how that storage capacity will impact bad weather days or autonomy of use. So what we would what, what our normal designs and the way that our DC systems have been applied is you will find that we would normally overspec the panel marginally. Because it's important for us within the configuration and the design of the, of the DC system to be able to get the battery full as quickly as we possible. So if we could get the battery full by 10 or 11 or 12 o'clock during the day, it effectively means that any day use and a fridge, for example, a fridge will run as an average within normal domestic use for about 10 hours constantly. 
the rest of the time the motor would have come to temperature and the motor would have been switched off. But that 10 hours doesn't only take place at night. So the 10 hours might take place for five hours at night and might take place for five hours in the day. If the battery is then full, or we at a charge, a state of charge on the battery that's acceptable, then the PV generation will go straight through and not necessarily charge the battery, but supply the fridge for the day use. And in the calculation of your diversity, you've always got to acknowledge that there's day use principles and there's night use principles. When you acknowledge that, you calculate the watt hours from the input side of the PV into the day use principles and you calculate the watt hours of night use into the battery calculation. With all this said and with all these calculations, I want to emphasize that you will make the, 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 the success or failure of a DC system by applying these principles. However, the componentry within the DC system have been designed in such a way that it will protect you in any case. So it will not allow your battery to, to be discharged to a level that will damage it. The, the two DC systems that we're going to introduce to you now has regulated and unregulated trip circuits in it. So what is that? That just means that we don't allow the customer to use too much power at one time because we want to be able to control his use because we want to keep the calculation of our diversity and use platform within a reasonable band of control so that we don't give the customer ad lib use and if the customer then applies something onto the system that's not been planned in the system, the system will actually um, let you know or react in a format to say that you are overusing the system. So I'm going to give you the explanation on the actual hardware itself. So in summary of this, understand what panel you're going to put in, understand what battery is in the system, and understand what the customer's load is going to be. By balancing those three, you can actually define exactly what the outcome of a DC system will be, how it will be managed, and if you are going to have trouble or not. In the distribution boxes, we would have loved to have gone to just lithium. We believe that that's the way of the future, and we, we believe that with the cycle ratio, and we're going to talk about the lithiums a bit later, with the cycle ratio and the time duration and the energy efficiency of a lithium battery, um, it's going to offer a different market, um, um, a sustainable and a long-term um, um, method of energy supply. However, currently, because certain DC systems are smaller, the, the lithium battery's cost is too high to apply into, into both systems. So what we've done is we've divided the two systems, both systems look exactly the same, and we've said that we're going to use a lead acid battery in one system to save costs for the client, and we're going to use a system for lithium, um, which then can deliver the, 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 the right amount of energy within the right price. So if we go into our DC systems, please note that there's a distribution box with a, with a lead acid battery, and the lead acid battery that we use is one of two different um, lead acid batteries. One is a dry cell battery, and one is a super cycle battery. The dry cell battery comes in at 30 amp, and the super cycle comes in at 60 amp. What does that mean? The super cycle battery has, the dry cell and the super cycle battery has um, been designed in such a way that it has the ability to discharge itself beyond that of a normal lead acid battery. In other words, we're using a decent lead acid battery. We're not just using a battery purely for the sake of supply and power with a short period of time. We're not chasing the sale, we're chasing the sustainability of the DC mechanism because the market that we supply need to have a sustainable means of, of energy delivery. So you'll see that the, in, the, in the brochures and in the technical detail which will follow, it will give you what cycle value the battery will have, how long you can expect that lead acid battery to last, and the technical specifications that is supplied with the equipment will define um, what the lead lithium battery will do, at what cycle ratio, and how long that would last. The, you're very welcome to ask questions about that. Um, and what we've also done in this configuration versus our previous configuration, we've built everything into one specific DB box. 
So it now becomes much easier. You just need to plug the panels in, switch the unit on, and effectively it, it should do what it's supposed to do. So let's have, a, let's have a look at the different um, two distribution boxes that we applied. And again, you'll find that in the brochure, and we refer to that as, in the, in the product code, the dry cell or lead acid battery, and the lithium iron um, phosphate battery. Between any solar panel um, and battery, you need some control. The better the control, the longer the battery lasts, the more effective your system is, the quicker it charges. And the difference between the two distribution boxes, the lead acid box, if I can, if I can call it that, has a PWM controller in it, a, a PWM solar controller. And what that is, it's managing the algorithm between the panels and charging the lead acid battery. This algorithm has already been set in our PWM controllers. Any solar control unit will have a limitation of ampage. You will notice on the side of the box, which we'll show you now, you'll notice on the side of the box there's a maximum amount of panels that you can put onto this PWM controller. So you cannot exceed 240 watt peak. In other words, 220, amp, uh, 220 watt peak panels would be the maximum amount of panels that you can deliver. And as mentioned earlier, you would take that and times that by your sun factor, so you'd then be able to start calculating how much potential power you will have average throughout the year. But what's important with the PWM controller is that you cannot exceed the voltage. So it's voltage sensitive. So the PWM controller in our DC um, distribution box is a 20 amp controller, which allows you to put 240 watt peak maximum on. In other words, you can put smaller on, but you may not exceed the voltage of 24 volt. So all the panels that are connected within the first distribution box need to be connected in parallel. You will find that the standard panels that you are buying, low voltage panels, would be um, a, a open circuit voltage of anything from 21 to 24 volt. By connecting the panels into a parallel uh, sequence, that voltage will be maintained and the ampage will be increased. So if you maintain the 240, you cannot exceed the ampage of the specific controller. The lithium distribution box does not have a PWM controller in it. The lithium has an MPPT um, controller in it. Now the difference between an MPPT and a PWM controller, they both fulfill the same function, but the MPPT is a lot more efficient within its functionality. Not only within its long, uh, longevity, but also within its technical ability. And you'll find that the, PW, uh, the MPPT controller that we are using also has a voltage limit. So here we can go to on on our distribution box number two with the lithium, we can go to a maximum of 330 watt peak of solar panels, but we can increase our voltage to up to 100 volt. So the DC voltage that can come in, if you're using small panels, you can series those, those panels. And if you had a panel that was generating a, an open circuit voltage of 24 volt by series in three of those panels, you would then get close to the 75 volt and our MBPT would physically be able to manage the charge algorithm from what that voltage is under 100 volt to the battery or the lithium battery. The beauty of the MBPT that we've also got in um, has, got, uh, uh, has got Bluetooth control on it. And you will also notice that the Bluetooth control has specifically been set for lithium, and the values within the battery have also been preset. So again, you're going to be able to go into that Bluetooth control, but it would be important that you don't change any of the settings. The beauty but with, for you to go into that control is you can actually see what it is currently producing. You'll be able to see the history of its production, and you'll be able to see any alarms or failures in, in that specific unit. So it gives you access into the actual charge algorithm and status of the, the, the facilitation between the panel and the battery.
with a lithium battery, additional to the MPPT, you will have a lithium BMS, and a lithium BMS would look um, something to this effect, and you'll notice on this specific BMS, and I'll take you to the, the battery a bit later, you will have wires that are going to each one of these cells. So keep in mind, a lithium battery consists of different amount of cells which are running at a nominal voltage of 3.2 volt, and these different, so here in this specific 12 volt uh, lithium battery for this DC system, we've got four cells, and we actually meter four cells. So what does this BMS do? Irrespective of what the MPPT is doing, the BMS is actually managing the balancing of the cells to maintain them within a specific value of each other to make sure that the condition of the battery stays the way it was designed to stay. So what's happening is the MPPT is sending energy, it's receiving energy from the panel, it's, it's managing that energy, it's sending the energy to the, the BMS, and the BMS is actually managing the energy into the cells to keep the cycle of input correct and manage it properly. So a BMS also has limitations on it, but the limitations of the BMS exceed the limitations of the actual MPPT, so you are comfortable that you just got to work off the limitations of the MPPT. The MPPT that's in the box is also a 20 amp. Um, you'll also notice that we allow 330 um, um, uh, watt peak of solar panels into into box with the lithium battery. It's because of the higher voltage, and therefore we also can current limit the MPPT to the position that we want, but don't exceed the voltage. So in summary, you've got the input of the solar panels, you know how many solar panels can be applied for box one with the PWM or the lead acid battery, it's 240 watt peak um, at a maximum voltage of 24 and you'll see that the sticker on the side of the box defines that for you. On box two with the lithium, also the sticker is on the box and you'll be able to see that sticker and the lithium has got 330 watt peak of maximum um, solar panels that's delivered to a 20 amp MPPT that has Bluetooth control. The PWM does, does not have any Bluetooth control. However, it's also important that when you open the box and you want to see what the settings of that PWM controller is, the settings on the, on the PWM controller is at setting C, Charlie. So what does setting C, Charlie mean? And when you, when you push the button, on the PWM controller, you will see that a C comes up. So C says that the controller will be managing your load output, and we're gonna talk about load output now, um, via the battery voltage. So just to give you a, an example, if your lead acid battery in the PWM controller goes below 11.2 volt, the PWM controller will switch your load off. Then the PWM controller will wait for the solar panels to charge up to 13.1 volt and then it will reconnect your load for you to use it. So if a customer has over discharged his battery and he's got to 11.2 volt, which in theory he should never get to, but let's assume he does, the PWM controller will switch him off. It will then wait for the next morning to charge the battery and we charge the battery at 13.8 volt on absorb and we float the battery at 13.5 volt. But once the charger gets the PWM controller to 13.1 volt, the load will reconnect. The MPPT does the same. So you'll notice that in the actual controller, between the solar panels, controller and battery, the controller is going to control certain aspects of the actual system itself. So we've discussed the different batteries. We're going to show you the pictures of the batteries. We've discussed the maximum PV that goes into it. Now I'm going to take you into the control board of each different DB box. You will find that the boards are very similar. So the boards that are in the, in the, in the DB box have an input fuse, they have an output fuse, a load fuse, and they have a main fuse. Then on the side of the DB box, they have a brake fuse. 
So just to give you a bit of an idea, the input fuse will be 25 amp. This information is inside the box. The load fuse will be 25 amp. The main breaker fuse will be 35 amp. And the outside control fuse will be 32 amp. Keep those ampage ratings as they are because they've been calculated according to the potential of the actual box itself, together with the safety proportion of if anything goes wrong in the box that the fuses will actually blow. Don't adapt those fuses in any format. All right, we've been talking about these two boxes and PWM and MPPT, but I think let's actually introduce you to the box itself. So what I'm going to first do is I'm going to introduce you to the box that takes in the lead acid battery, which I've referred to as the PWM controller, and just give you a quick difference between um, the two boxes and show you what they look like and open them up for you so that you can actually see what I'm talking about. So the box on the table is, and you'll see that we've kept them looking the same because in the configuration format of different clients and customers, we allow customers and our associated partners to design their own colors and, and have their own labeling and have their own imaging done on the boxes if so required and if the volume is, is acceptable. So in, in the introduction, the actual housing is, is made from steel. Um, you'll notice that there's a bracket that looks like this, which has got a DC unit on it. This gets bolted to the, to the wall, and the box actually slides in and just slips over that, which makes the assembly very easy. Just make sure that you've got secure bolts into that wall. You'll find that the bracket at the back will, sh will show you that it's got a clip-in bracket, and this bracket just slides in to, to, to that there very, very simply. So the beauty of, a, of this, whoopsie, the beauty of this configuration, we'll get to this now just to give you that detail. The beauty of this configuration is that you don't have separate cables to your, to your battery. Um, you don't have to wire any circuitry in or tr uh, circuit breakers in. The box actually will manage that total thing for you. So when you've got the panels, you'll notice that these distribution boxes are supplied with pre-made cables and here you would need to select what length pre-made cables are, and we use MC4 connectors. So MC4 connectors coming in from the solar panels, clipping into the panels as MC4 connectors, going straight into the box, and clipping into the box um, at, this, at, this, at this point here. Check the polarity. The polarity of the cables are normally checked here and tested under the final QC process, but just make sure that you put the polarity correct. Once you've done that, you'll also see next to that there's a sticker defining the maximum amount of PV and the maximum voltage in that box. Additional to this, you have a, a cell phone charger. So you'll see the top part of the cell phone charger, there will be a light on the cell phone charger just confirming that the power point is there. The one cell phone charger is a 1 amp, the other one is a 2.1 amp. You'll find with the smarter cell phone chargers and the bigger units, they need a bit more ampage to be able to charge, and, they, and, and the customer would normally work this out quite carefully. This specific box with the PWM controller, this has a battery indicator in it, and it's purely just a battery capacity indicator. You'll see at the bottom of it, it shows you that it goes down from 100% to 20%, and the battery indicator is gauged on voltage. So once the voltage of the battery drops proportionally, it will effectively drop um, the, the, the lights that, that are indicating. When it's charging, keep in mind that this battery indicator will be running up and down so that it's showing that it's actually charging. The next <coughs> um, position here is status and you'll see that there's a, a green LED. So while the box is functioning within its design, the status is showing you that it's green, the box is on, and that everything is okay. Just below it, you've got a short circuit or an overload position. This is a red LED, and in the event that there's any short circuit on the outside of the load side, this <clears throat> light will come on and start flashing and stay flashing. So it's very sensitive to short circuit, but also, um, if you have an overload, you'll find that this light also starts flashing. We'll tell you a, a little bit about that and how to fix that um, a bit later. Additional to that, on the box, you have... Um, you, I mentioned to you that you've got a 32-amp external fuse, and this is just a brake fuse that allows the main... So this is like the main on and off um, switch. 
So the fuse goes in, you close it, the green light will come on, the red light will flash once and then go off, and you know that if the green light is on, then the unit is ready for, for operations. The two points that you've got here are very important for you to understand what the difference is. And as you get this box within this configuration, this will be the standard delivery if you want a change that can be changed. So the top point is what we would refer to as a regulated load control, and the bottom point will be an unregulated load control. What does that mean? I'm going to show you what the trip circuit inside the box looks like. We preset that trip circuit at a maximum of 4 amp. You can change that to 6 amp if you want. So that would be 6 amp times 12.5 uh, or times a 12 volt battery. If, if they exceed the presetting ampage on this port, the red light will come on and will show that they've overused it. So let's just talk about that quickly. A television or the lights um, of 3 watt, you need, you need 4 of them, which is equal to 1 amp. So in the lead acid scenario, you must probably going to have lights, cell phone charging, a radio, maybe one fan, and maybe a small TV. All those appliances, if you put them on at the same time, will still be under 4 amp. So why would you then need to set it to 6 amp? If you're going to have a bigger TV and, and your proportion of panel is correct, then you can take the 4 amp setting and you can change that to 6 amp. If the customer exceeds the value of the 4 or the 6 on this port, the unit will automatically go off and stay off until the unit is reset. There's two ways to reset that unit. One way is by opening the fuse and then closing the fuse again. You will see the power will go off, the power will come back on again, and if the load has been reduced to below your set point, the unit will come back on again. If the load is still in excess of your set point, it will go back to fault or warning. What we've got here is we've really got the second point as an unregulated load. And ideally, what this was used for is for a fridge. Now, it will be very unlikely to use this specific DB box for a fridge, but if you need to exceed the ampage that you have on the regulated load, then effectively you would use the, the, the bottom points. I would advise you that you've got to give some thought to your actual way of presenting the distribution box in the market, but you do have the option to have this and this on the regulated circuit, or this and this on an unregulated circuit. Currently, as the standard in the company, it comes regulated and unregulated. We specifically don't mark that because we don't want the customer necessary to understand it. This helps you manage the customer load profile and helps you have a sustainable system as an integrator. If I open the box, then you're going to start seeing what the PWM controller looks like. So I'm going to take both of these um, plates off and you can see the PWM controller is sitting on a control board that has been secured properly. You'll also notice that the MC4 connectors go to the solar input port, and right next to the solar input port is the solar fuse, which has been defined on the sticker right next door to it. Additional to the solar, solar fuse, you've got <coughs> um, the, the battery and PV coming into the solar controller, and then the load is now controlled via this specific PWM controller, which by pushing that button there, you will see that um, as mentioned earlier, the C will come up, which means that this controller will, be, will manage this total um, management board under voltage. You will also notice that we have a regulated circuit and an unregulated circuit, and this is the battery input. So you'll find that's the battery fuse, in other words, the main breaker fuse, and this is the load fuse. So if, there's, if the, the trip circuit doesn't pick up a short, or if there's a short within the board itself, the load fuse will go. If there's a problem with the PV side, the PV fuse will blow. And if there's a holistic problem with the unit, the battery fuse will go. 
So you'll notice that <clears throat> this which I have in my hand is what we would refer to as the trip circuit. The trip circuit will be positioned on the top of the PC board there, and this trip circuit needs to be secure because this will allow the regulated and unregulated control of the, of the output load. On the trip circuit itself, you've got two latches. These latches, this latch here, controls the LEDs that I've showed you on the face of the, of the distribution board, and this top latch here controls the ampage. So if the latch is on the left, well, from here, on my left-hand side, your right-hand side, um, and if I take the latch off, you see there's three pins. If I put it onto the left-hand side pins from my side, then I have four amp regulated, and if I move the latch off and I put it on my right-hand side, then I have six amps regulated. That's as simple as that really is. I mentioned earlier that there's two ways to reset this unit. One way is to open the main breaker on the side. So if the customer has overused the system and the red light has come on, the red light has come on because he's overused it on current, on load, based on this setting, but two, because there's a short, short circuit. If he restores the short circuit, or if he restores his load below the ampage of this regulated circuit, and he opens the fuse, the, the unit will come on. You can also go in and here's a reset button that can be pushed to reset this function if so required. So many times um, when the customer overuses the system and it depends where you apply in the system, we then send a technician out to train the customer what is done incorrectly and why the system is overloaded. So some people will try and put an inverter on it. It will immediately overload the circuit. Some people will try and put an AC appliance on it. It will immediately sh show a short circuit and the unit will go into, into protect mode. So <clears throat> not only short circuit protection, but, but also ampage control on the circuit board. The, the difference and the main difference between, between the PWM controller and the display board is really the meter. So, um, very simply, you've got an input from PV when, when you get the unit, and the battery would then be secured in the unit. It will be closed off and sealed. Um, you've got an unregulated load, a regulated load, an, uh, a PV input, and a main breaker. That's all you need to know about the unit. Now I'm going to move to the lithium battery unit. All right, this is the second box, and as I mentioned earlier, you can create a difference in your two distribution boxes by selecting different colors. The boxes have been designed exactly the same. You will also notice that the PV input is exactly the same. You will notice that on the output side, you've got the same fuse. You've also got a non-regulated load and you've got a regulated load. The main difference <coughs> um, between this box and the lead acid box is the actual meter, and this is called a battery column meter, which is going to show you what the voltage is, which is going to show you what um, the available power is. It's going to show you how much power it's actually consuming. You have the same cell phone charger in it, um, and you have the same status lights in it. But if I open the box, if I open the box, you will find that this box has an MPPT in it. So you'll notice that inside the box, it's the same management board that the first box had. It's got the fuse ratings on the side of the box. You'll find that this is an MPPT controller. And next door to it, which is very interesting, is a shunt. So the shunt is going to tell you the information on this meter and we're going to talk about how we've actually programmed this column meter so that the customer can understand how much power he's got in the unit and how much power you will have left in the unit. So inside this specific box, this is the lithium battery that we were talking about. All right, so this is the lithium battery that comes into the specific uh, unit. Um, I'm going to pull the BMS out so that I can show you what the battery looks like. Remember I said to you that the BMS is, control, is controlling the different cell balances. It also controls too high voltage and it also controls too low voltage. And it's an, it's an aut automatic preset in, which is also available for you in the technical documents. 
in this configuration, please see that the blue wire goes to negative, so we refer to blue to, to, to the battery, and the black goes to the load. So I've pulled the BMS out. What I'd like to do is just take this protective cover off, which is, which is quite a job, to show you actually what the cells look like inside. So by looking at that, you can see that there's one, two, three, four lithium phos cells. The specific one is a nominal voltage of 12.8 volt for the battery itself, which means that it's a 100 amp cell. So this has 12 times 12.8 times 100. It's 1.280 kilowatt um, hours in it. You'll also notice that we've cut in that it's marked which is negative and positive. So this battery will be set in here and if forever you have to put the battery in please be cautious when sliding the battery in that it actually doesn't change the wires on the management or control board you'll also notice that <clears throat> the battery in the box has got holes in it and this battery is secured in with bolts through the back of the box so once it's secured it can also be taken out and configured to a bigger battery or a smaller battery if so required all right, now just speaking about the battery, you saw I pulled the BMS wires out. If you've got the BMS wires out, you will find that the BMS switches itself off automatically. So if I had to meter, meter the power between positive and negative here, I would get 12.8 or 13.5, depending on the state of charge of the battery. But if I had to meter here, I would get zero. So by putting this in, I then reactivate. So if at all, this is, if at all this cable has been pulled out, please notice that the BMS will switch itself off. Also notice that if the BMS finds that you've charged it incorrectly, and keep in mind that the programming of the, of the MPPT, which I'm going to show you now, has already been done, but for whatever reason, if the BMS finds that you're charging it incorrectly, it will switch itself off, and if you're discharging it incorrectly, it will also switch itself off. So keep in mind that this BMS is not only managing, but it's also protecting your battery. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually connect the battery up to the actual DB box to show you what the DB box looks like and what happens when it comes on. So if I connect the power onto the DB box cables, and normally you would not need to do this because it will all be connected for you, you'll see by me switching it on, the status light has now come on indicating that the unit is functional and it's working correctly. The color meter has been programmed and let me just define this programming so what you'll find is that it's showing you the voltage of the battery 13.33 remember this battery is charged at 13.8 and it, and it floats at 13.5 so already we've used a little bit of power out of it. it there it will show you how much power you're using at the moment and there it will show you how much time you have left based on the power that you're using. That will show you that the state of charge is at 100%, but you've got 99% or 99 amp hours left out of the 100 amp hours to still use. So when I want to set this, and you won't need to set it, it'll be set, but if you want to set it, you push the entry button, and by pushing and holding it in, it will show you what settings have actually been put for this cooler meter to actually give you the calculations. We preset it, but I must also tell you that we preset it so that it doesn't go to 100% of zero. So you'll notice that I'm switching, I'm not, my calculation starts at 12 volt and ends at 13.5 volt. If I had to drop that 12 volt to 11.5 volt because the lithium battery is, is really flat at 11.5 at volt, you'll find that the ratio of the cooler meter will advise the client on the time to use so it's a conservative setting in this cooler meter. So it will automatically go back to its setting now. And now what I want to do is I just want to show you how to connect onto the MPPT. All right, we're going to talk about how do you access the MPPT. So we've given you a rough summary of the cooler meter. And please notice that in the brochures and the technical specs, all the voltages of the battery, the individual cells, and the pack capacities have been defined with your usage patterns and how you would manage your battery. The cooler meter gives us a little bit of of control over the battery 
and that control to integrate to the customer because the customer doesn't know. And the higher we set the voltage, the more conservative we are in our, in our control to the customer. To access the MPPT, you would need to download the app called Victron Connect. As soon as you download the app, and, and in the office there's quite a few components, you will see the actual MPPT, which is referred to as 120. You will notice that the 120 has been picked up, and don't forget to switch on your Bluetooth, because otherwise it won't work. The unit must also be on, and you can see I've powered the unit from an external battery. So by connecting onto that specific MPPT, you will see that it will it will take a bit of time and then load you down. Now you can see all the detail of the of the MPPT. You will notice on Victron Connect that um, screen that came up is saying, "Do you want to put a protect password on it?" So here's something that you've got to decide. If you want the customer to be able to see this, then you don't put a protect password on it. If you then want the customer to see it and you feel the customer is adequate in managing it, you can put a password on it and give the password to the customer. So these are decisions that you're going to have to make. This will then show you the history of what this MPPT has done, how much it's produced, when it's produced. And in light of our discussion earlier, remember we have predictions. Once you start seeing in your area, you can actually use this information as the calculation of the PV input ratio to the actual size of the panel that you have. In the little corner, you will notice that there's a setting um, platform. And again, I would seriously advise that you don't set this. However, if you do talk to SSS, we can talk you through additional settings that are available that will not necessarily be covered here today. But in the battery settings, you will also know that it's been set to do the right algorithm charge at 13.8 on absorption, and then it will float at 13.5. We have not limited the current of the MPPT. The MPPT will produce at 20 amp, and this is a 12 volt system. So just giving you a bit of indication of how do you access the MPPT, you need to download Victron Connect, um, which, is, which is an app that you can easily download. You connect to the MPPT, and it'll give you this information. Now what I want to show you is, so we've covered the management board at the back. We've, um, we've given you the understanding of a regulated load and an unregulated load. Um, we've showed you the MPPT. You, you, it's an easy plug-in um, um, modular system, so that becomes very simple. What I now would like to demonstrate for you is how does the trip circuit work. To understand the trip circuit, I've got a machine at the back of me that is a load, it's an electronic load machine. So you'll see that I've set this machine, and if I put the machine on, currently right now, this unit, as you see it here, is supplying the load at 3.9 amps. So what, what we've got here is we've got a machine that is mimicking a load of 3.9 amps. The trip circuit, as I mentioned to you, has two settings, a 4 amp or a 6 amp. This specific trip circuit has been set to 4 amp. So the theory behind that is as I increase this load and I increase it above 4 amp, you will notice once I've increased it above 4 amp, the unit now has sensed that the load was more than the preset latch that was set and has gone into a short circuit or an overload position. What I now have to do is I've got to remove that short circuit or overload position because it has now switched the outside regulated point off. So what we've, what we've shown you now is that the trip circuit has tripped because we use too much power through the regulated load. Now, in this specific instance, <clears throat> if I had to open this circuit breaker or this fuse um, um, on the side of the box, I'll be breaking the power to the main system. For the purposes of this exercise, I'm just going to disconnect this power, and you'll see everything has gone off, the meter and all the lights. And if I have to reconnect it, then the system will now go through its own mechanism to see that the load has been reduced, and the status is back on again, and the load is now functioning correctly again. So that's the reset process. 
Again, the reset process is there to protect an overload of the, of, 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 of the actual DC system within your calculation of what the customer has used or is planning to use, um, except the fridge calculation which goes through the unregulated load um, output. So that gives you a very quick summary of the functionality of the two different D D um, um, DC DB boxes, one with the lithium and one with the lead acid. And you will notice that this is the lithium battery which I showed you, and this is an example of the SuperCycle Victron 60 amp battery which goes into the lead acid unit. Additional to that, what we've done <coughs> is we've designed different kinds of plug boxes, DC plug boxes, that will help you in the configuration of the customer's house. So, if I may just explain, this plug box is fed from the regulated supply. So you create a loop from your regulated supply through your house, go into the lights, the light switches, and then if the customer would like to charge his telephone next to his bed because it's dignity of use, he can then get a 12 volt a 12 volt um, charger and plug a 12 volt charger in. He could plug his DC radio in, his DC TV in, and if needed, a DC <coughs> DSTV. You get different plug boxes. So you'll get a plug box without the 12 volt charger. You'll get a plug box with a USB charger. You will also get a plug box with a voltage control and ampage control device inside it. Um, for example, when you apply a DSTV onto a DC system, the voltage and the ampage must be controlled uh, very carefully. So when there is a DSTV involved, we put in a little chip behind this plug box that makes sure that the voltage drop or whatever the amp current used is, is maintained at a specific standard, um, keeping the DSTV functioning correctly. So that gives you a summary of the two DB boxes. And what I would like to do now is just show you some of the appliances, show you a, a setup where the DB box has already been connected. Um, <clears throat> and then prior to showing you that, which is just demonstrative, is I'd like to summarize our, um, the important facets around these two DB boxes. We've tried to make this as modular and compact as possible. 99% of the time you'll get it completely closed, completely QC'd from the factory and your choices are going to be very easy. Are you going to take a lead acid which is a cheaper unit than the lithium? The technical specs are available for both. Together with the technical specs of each component that has been built in here, your responsibility to read that, make sure you understand it and ask any questions that you need with regards to that so that you get a comprehensive understanding of the DC distribution system. The fundamentals of the system is what power you put in, in needs to be stored and what power you stored or put in, in needs to be used within a control fashion. That's why this has been designed in this format. We have found that the smaller solar home systems have no control in them. So even though the salesmen say they do, you've got to manage your customer to create a sustainable method that if you've got a lithium battery, you have the potential there of between 10 and 15 years of storage. Your potential of your panel is between 10 and 15 years of storage and it takes a solar home outside of its original designated short-term life into a long-term energy distribution method. The super cycle under the conditions of correct management within your diversity calculations of the load has the same thing. You can go up to five years depending on the use of the state of charge of that cycle. So we're trying to take DC, which is affordable, which is, which is controllable, which is manageable to a market <clears throat> that doesn't have a lot of capital to spend on systems, but wants a fridge or a freezer or a fridge and a freezer, lights, TV, DSTV, um, hair dryers, um, fans, and at least they have a function of energy which is controlled and, and can be maintained. So from now, we'll go down to the, to the bottom and just show you what some of the appliances look like and what a system has looked like with the lithium battery that is connected up. So what you see here is a complete system with its plug box, with some lights, with a fridge connected. You'll see there's a DSTV, there's a small TV. We've got a 32-inch um, TV behind me here. 
you'll see different components that can be used within the 12 volt range, which is air, which is hair dryers and fans and little fridges <coughs> and fans that are running. So you can see it's important that you understand what is available, but more importantly, you've got to understand what you want to sell and what the ampage draw of each component is to define how your system is going to work and then calculate the diversity to manage that system in its holistic view. If I take this unit on and I start putting that unit on, <clears throat> you'll notice that I've switched the main switch on and there the lights are coming on. You'll see that this fridge has been running for some time and the fridge and freezer um, functions um, correctly and, is, and, and, and the fridges have been well tested and, and, and well documented and again there's a full range of fridges that we can give you that information on together with hi-fi. So what I'm showing here is for this specific market the unit has been designed, it looks pretty against the wall, it's got high-tech equipment in, <clears throat> you need to know how to manage that equipment. You need to know what available appliances are there, form your own packages, create your own color, color schemes um, get your marketing material explaining exactly what you're presenting. Don't allow the customer to lead you because you now know what your limitation is, what your storage capacity is, what your load control is, and by applying this in a correct, well-managed, well-thought-out fashion gives us a long and sustainable um, DC distribution um, unit. Thank you very much.